seems to me that this day has gone awfully fast, but um, we have now a reflection session with um, uh, J James Simon from CRL, Heiner Schnelling, who is the director of the Senckenberg um, University Library in Frankfurt, and uh, Michael Seidel, who is a friend of Wes and um, uh, has a lot of, um, he was at Cornell way back when. I think we overlapped very, very slightly um, and has been an active member of Wes and um, you can read his, um, you, you can read not all about him, but a little bit about him on page 25. And you can read about the others too, who I have poorly introduced. But uh, Michael is now the director of the library school at Humboldt University in Berlin, and several other things too. Um, so, and, um, so we're going to start by, um, I'm, I would like to start by reading a statement that Jim Neal sent us since he was unable to attend. Um, and here's what he has to say. On behalf of the American Library Association, I send greetings to the attendees at the International Symposium focused on library scholars and partnerships and new directions. I regret that I am unable to participate in the important discussions. I spoke earlier this week in Frankfurt at the STM annual conference, but had to return to New York for professional commitments. In 2014, I spoke at the German National Library on the topic, The 21st Century Researcher, Does the Library Still Matter? I argued in that presentation that libraries must sustain their vitality, their virtuosity, and their virtuousness to remain relevant. In the classroom, in the library, at the bedside, expert and focused on the public interest. They must pursue transformation in what they do, how they are perceived, and how they do it. We must advance from the kumbaya of cooperation to more systemic, radical, global collaboration. The ALA celebrates the three-year partnership with the German library community designed to strengthen links between our libraries, intensifying exchange and knowledge sharing with the goal of fostering lasting relationships between individuals, institutions, and associations. Have a great conference. Um, and he, uh, um, we had a lovely exchange. I, I sincerely believe that he would have loved to be here, and of course everyone knows that he would have been a fantastic um, addition to, to the program. But now we were on to three other fantastic additions to the program, and um, I think I'm going to sit down. and try to turn on this mic, and um, we're going to hear what, about what struck first, first perhaps, and you can each speak twice or once or however long you want to. I'm uh, going to let, I'm not going to be a very active moderator, okay? <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> um, um, so, so we'll, uh, we'll have a chance to hear what struck uh, these gentlemen about the day and then what they think are some of the you know, immediate ideas they have for um, directions, concrete things we can do. And then we'll open it up for, um, for as much discussion as we can have. And then we'll go have wine. Um, so. <laughs> So are you implying that uh, the three of us are going to keep them from the wine? Um, I don't think you're probably able to do that, but... I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, yes. So Dr. Schnelling, would you like to start? Yes. Um, what struck me most, uh, what was the most challenging item that I heard in these uh, series of wonderful presentations? Um, I think it is the uh, challenge to get uh, the scientists, the researchers, involved as partners in our project. This confirms me that uh, the experience we made with our six FIDs, and I hope that number seven will be arriving by the end of this year, 
uh, it was a permanent communication with the target group, with the group of researchers or their representatives. And together we developed a series of proposals for bespoke devices that uh, were suited, tailored to meet, to meet their needs for research. And uh, we were very happy to get the approval for Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. But again, um, to get the scientists, the researchers involved in our project, that is the most challenging thing, I think, for the future. Um, what is noteworthy, I think, was the contribution that one of the American colleagues made as to collection building. We know that the focus of our work has been shifting from uh, collection building to access uh, for years now. But all the same, I think we need, we're going to need in the future, an active collection building on all special fields. The most surprising or unexpected item I met today was Charlie Abdo, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Michael Seidel. Um, well, I have uh, three things that I was thinking about saying here. Uh, not working. Push the little button. There, I pushed it twice. Is that better? No. But this one. I'll switch. Ah, that's much better. Um, so, I've got three things that I think I will say. One is, uh, this has been a wonderful opportunity for me to see many old friends uh, and to take part again in some sense in conversations that we started with GNARP, uh, the German North American Resources Project, back at the beginning of this millennium. Uh, I was there, I was one of the people involved in putting it together. I remember our having meetings both in the U.S. and actually the one I remember best was a meeting that Elmar Mittler hosted in Göttingen where uh, all of the Americans tried to speak German and the Germans tried to speak English. Um, it was not the ideal way of doing it and we finally agreed to each person would speak their mother language and it since everyone understood each other, that worked a bit better. Um, but understanding, my second point really, understanding across borders and across languages uh, is not the only point. Uh, many people in this room, I think most people in this room are multilingual to some extent, but we don't necessarily understand the different institutional cultures. Uh, I have had the advantage of working on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I have been a long time here in Germany, but I was also a long time in the United States, including at Cornell, which I enjoyed. And our structures are different. The amount of resources are different. And one of the, the things that I think was striking about this, this last set of panel was making it clear. Uh, how many technical people do you actually have to put through a project makes a very big difference in what you can do. Um, how much money you've got coming into your budget to buy resources makes a very big difference. A difference in how we think about collection development. Um, the third point I'd like to make is also something that came up in the last couple of sessions, and that is um, the word data. Uh, we've been putting a lot of emphasis on the humanities, and I'm, for my sins, once again, Dean of Humanities uh, at our university. Uh, so obviously I have an interest there. Uh, my background is actually as an historian, uh, even though I've worked in computer science much of my life. We need to defend the humanities often against the wishes of our colleagues in the natural sciences because they they need money, they need money desperately, and we do too, and we have to say that. But when it comes to the content of our libraries, we also need to realize data is there. If we don't recognize the need for data, we're going to lose 
that piece of the information world to the computer centers, and they're not really in a good position to manage the access. Uh, the other piece I think that's really important there is realizing that text mining is a part of our lives today. Um, Jay Stork was, was saying it just now, um, uh, the, 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 the distant, distance reading, Franco Moretti, uh, who visited us not too, too long ago, this is how humanities scholars are actually going to be working in the future, and our libraries need to be ready to do that. I haven't used my full 90 minutes yet, but I'll stop. I agree with both of my esteemed panelists here on, on some of those reflections. I, I, only, I took it a, a bit more literally, and I'm going to reflect back like a mirror uh, in a way that, um, as I heard the, the presentations today and the discussions and, and tried to shape a, an argument about maybe what was said today, um, the themes, of course, of the, the symposium uh, in the call for papers had to do with innovation, collaboration, or partnerships. And uh, I think we saw ample uh, and excellent evidence of all of those in the, in the presentations and in the poster sessions. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to go through those, I, I do encourage you at the reception to, to stop by because there were some truly engaging ones there. Um, we had a very enlightening and engage, engaging beginning to the day uh, looking at the European National Institution support, uh, especially for advanced academic research, and, and that was quite enlightening to me, um, whereas you know, many subsequent presenters provided comparative insight into the innovation within the academic institutions themselves. Um, and it's clear, I, I think, from all of the presentations that you know, we've moved well beyond the realm of traditional models of print collection. Um, print is still very essential uh, to the studies that all of us support. Uh, yet, where the innovation and where we, where, as, as Michael said, we need to be heading, I think, is in support of, of the future of research. Um, people, will, people will come. The, the digital humanists right now are, are small. They're pinpoints on a map. Uh, if you represented that as a heat map growing forward, though, I suspect it's just going to get hotter and hotter. Um, I think we've also agreed and well moved beyond the, the idea of comprehensive collecting, as we heard that in most of the discussions. Uh, those were reflected in the, the new model of the, the FID, the, F, the FID, um, as well as Kaiser's uh, rep representation of what was happening at uh, academic institutions in the U.S., um, perhaps the exception being m maybe the, the BNF and Gallica. Um, most institutions are faced with responding to immediate scholarly needs instead of attempting comprehensive collecting. Uh, and in the DFG's case, that's a funding imperative. Dr. Zomel and, and Dr. Greuter described insightful means of collecting feedback from scholars towards that end. Uh, and one of the especially innovative approaches, I thought, was uh, in the Romanistic FID connecting the, to the principal communication website of romanistic.de. I think that's, that's an essential link between the scholars and the libraries. Uh, and so uh, I think we should think about that more broadly, uh, perhaps discussing more. And Valerie Baudouin uh, offered a useful methodology for assessing our disparate audiences, taking evaluation perhaps a step beyond the, the simple library assessment approach and working with social science specialists can offer new ways of looking at the impact of our, of our activities. Uh, many of the other presenters, including Lydia Uziel and, and Jennifer Dalzin, presented tangible case studies, I think, of institutional approaches, boosted by connections uh, among individuals, be they scholars, amateurs, or other, as well as other library connections. And that, I think, is, is the heart of, of the approach here. Um, so really, one of the, the biggest takeaways, I think, for me was in listening to all of these approaches and in, those, in the most recent panels about mining the past, making new types of research available from traditional collections and considering new ways of approaching digitized and born digital collections, really the innovation I thought here um, really was the energy, that harnessing that individual and collective energy of those libraries and librarians uh, and the scholars who have a true passion for this work. Uh, and I think that's really where we want to think about harnessing that energy and, and pushing us forward. And I know you want to talk about some further thoughts on how we can do that. Thank you. 
Well, you've just wrapped, all three of you have, um, I'd like to be sitting out there listening instead of trying to, trying to moderate, but uh, thank you, all three, so much. Um, so now, James has led into the next question, which is what can be done next to support our conversation and um, partnerships and shared goals and move things forward on a small and large scale? Well, I just grabbed the microphone, so maybe I'll talk okay. first and then pass it on. Um, what can be done next is already been said here to a certain degree. Uh, we may not actually have a lot of institutional knowledge about our different organizations, but we do work well together on projects. And doing more individual projects uh, together, Germany, France, the United States, is one of the ways that we enrich our experience. I think that's very important. Uh, I am the executive director of the iSchools, and this is one of the things that we have fostered too. We have tried to foster actually moving people um, across space as well as, as just having them work together. The degree to which we can do this with video, There's, there are really excellent video tools today. Um, we're not just talking about Skype, we're talking about things like Zoom from Stanford that, that are very effective in having you have an experience as if you were there. Um, I think that's essential. I want to make one more comment, and it's, it's um, something that James said. Um, I'm, I'm often called at my university someone who does digital humanities, and I don't deny it. Um, indeed, digital humanities is a popular topic, but I'm not actually a digital humanist. Um, I'm an historian, and I use digital tools. Uh, I've not fundamentally changed how I think about the past. I'm not fundamentally different as a scholar. Uh, I've got a different set of tools that I can use. And I think this is important for us all. I, I think this is a point that Franco Moretti also often makes with the literature. We are the people in our disciplines. We are scholars in our own rights. But we've got a whole new range of tools, a range of tools that we in libraries actually are making available to people. And that's something that is absolutely key. OK. Um, well, uh, from, from my perspective, uh, and I come from a, a particular angle, and that is international cooperation being the, the core of our, our own activities, um, I, I agree. I think projects together, um, co-institutional or binational or multinational, are, are critical. Uh, and that those ideas surface naturally. And they don't have to be coordinated uh, top down. They should emerge from the ground up. And I think that's, we saw plenty of evidence here today and hopefully are making connections. But Claude Potts, of course, offered a, a framework that exists perhaps to uh, help grow those ideas. Uh, and that's through the global resources programs of CIFNAL and GNARP. Uh, these were institutions that were set up to form partnerships and to uh, work on library exchange and continued professional contact and cross-border cooperation. And, and I would just encourage you to think about using that as, as a, a jumping off point or a, a um, springboard for considering cooperative ideas, ideas of ongoing digitization of French pamphlets or you know, work, working more closely within the um, specialized collection areas and licensing. Um, but I also wanted to pick up a little bit here just on what Bernie Riley said at the beginning of the day, um, as mentioning the redesigning the supply chain of information. Um, it, it is becoming clear that uh, past practices of libraries of collecting prints, uh, making um, journeys out relying solely on, on book suppliers to provide us the content that we're looking for um, is, is not working the same way in the electronic era and that is incumbent on us to design new solutions. Um, in the back of the, the folder that, that you received in your registration is a flyer that we put together regarding a, a program that we're calling the Global Collections Initiative. 
This is a project that's emerged from the cooperative programs that we've supported through the Global Resources Network, like NARP and CIFNAL. Uh, and it's a, it's a new initiative that we're, we're, found, we're forming as a cross-border program um, of collaboration among North American and European institutions to expand electronic access to print resources and to further acquire um, and develop electronic resources for research, and particularly in the areas of area and international studies. This is the core of, of CRL's activities, and um, we've long represented the area studies world, uh, in particular for areas outside of the global north, such as Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, and, and Slavic and Eastern Europe. This approach is really to, to build on the historical collections uh, of North American and European institutions um, that have long engaged in these areas, uh, here in, in Germany, in the UK, and elsewhere in Europe, um, where we've sustained the support and collecting of, this, of these world areas. And uh, we're hoping, and often these institutions hold, by the way, more comprehensive collections than many of the libraries in those regions themselves. So we're looking to expose those collections for scholars among a, an expanded network, um, including institutions in those regions of interest. So how do we unlock access to those collections? How do we work together to, to broaden and expose that material? Well, it, it, to our mind, it starts with the collections we already have. Um, European institutions uh, and United, uh, institutions in North America have these collections that are slowly being digitized or maybe scooped up through the Hadi Trust program or something like that. But sustained digitization and digital access to primary source collections is falling further and further behind those published resources. Um, so we're working to, on a coordinated framework, hopefully, hopefully successfully, um, to compare and harmonize the research interests among a cooperation of partners um, and formulating approaches to cooperative digitization of those resources to make them more widely accessible both to scholars in uh, North America and Europe, but also through partnerships with institutions uh, uh, in, in other world areas. Um, we're starting this program with Latin American studies, uh, and we formed some collaborations with the Ibero-Americanische Institute here in Germany, uh, several institutions in the UK, uh, and several institutions in, in Latin America, one being the Colegio de México. So, uh, we're, we're working on building these relations and pulling together our resources. Um, this also calls for, beyond our own collections, though, working with the publishers uh, and the suppliers of this information, many of whom are in the room, um, to help strengthen the discovery and the supply of those resources, especially in areas where the infrastructure for supply is weak. So we need to develop new systems uh, for harmonizing our, our interests in licensing of existing resources. Um, we need to prioritize uh, and speak with uh, producers of resources that have those locked up still in print or in microfilm vaults uh, and to express our, our scholars' interests and needs in making those more widely accessible. Uh, these, these are areas that we're actively exploring with those partner institutions and we hope to produce some successful results that we can bridge off of Latin America into further world areas. I, I think this is important for this audience because we're not here just to talk about Germanistic or Francophonie. Um, we're here to talk about supporting the scholars with the resources that they need, and this is one way that CRL is taking that approach. I feel like I've gone on far too long, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, just a few remarks to conclude on that. Um, one of the slides this morning read Building the Future, and we have a couple of bricks at our hands just to do that, and uh, these are very common things, you know. As I said before, accept researchers as partners, seek their cooperation, make our collections digitally available, make them come to life by applying text and data mining. Uh, look what happen what's happening next door in the libraries next to our own place and accept international cooperation. That's precisely what we are doing today. That's it? That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Now, there's a chance, there's an opportunity for anyone in the audience to ask our, our reflectors here questions or for them to ask you questions. So, and. Well, I'll ask them a question. Okay. Um, going back to my teaching, how many of you actually 
have had an experience at a library in another country? How many of you actually worked there? That's, that's actually quite a, a substantial number. I would say at least a third, maybe a half in the room. And I think that's one of the indications of why a meeting like this is successful, is because we actually have a level of understanding that helps us move forward. And that was really just done in order to give you a chance to think of your questions. <laughs> Old teaching technique. <laughs> or we'll call on you. So I guess less a question than a comment. Um, I thought in going from what Michael Seidel just uh, talked about, the importance that you, you aren't a digital humanist, but you're a researcher. And I thought it was really important um, that the digital projects that were talked about today weren't about the digital projects themselves, but were about actually the research that came out of them. And, um, or the research that was promising research and, and pedagogical um, uh, possibilities that, that, that are to come and, and why they were created that way rather than just, oh, it creates this, this cool graph or this cool visualization, but really what we can learn the second step after um, we have the data and after we have these uh, different tools. And so I thought that was um, something that we as librarians really need to think of because that's what we do. We set the stage, we provide the resources for this type of research to happen. So just a comment. I like it. Well, perhaps I could follow up. Um, because when I was listening to you, Michael, and thinking that we aren't fundamentally different as researchers, we're the same. I think one of the things that's different, because I wear two hats. Um, I am still a researcher and do active humanities research in the Middle Ages, but then I'm also a librarian. And one thing that I encounter in this sort of dual world is that as a librarian, I'm very engaged in thinking about digital humanities, but then there's a the question of training. Yes, we have these new tools, but we need a lot of training in order to use this data. So I think that's where maybe my question for us as librarians, what is our role for all of us in helping humanists to actually use these tools and to train. We have a fantastic digital humanities librarian who Sylvia, thank you, featured, who has done a lot of instruction at our university. But without that, how do we help people? I, I think that's absolutely essential. We have to help people to use these tools that we have and they often they are, are not familiar, and that goes for faculty as well as students. One of our goals at my school is to train the future librarians to be able to do this. Uh, we're not making them into professors, into docenten, but they do have a teaching role. We all have a teaching role when it comes to the people who come to our libraries. And it's not just that, Michael. I think it's helping to, them to construct their research approach. Uh, they, they, they heard of a tool and they may want to use that tool, but they, they don't know why they want to use that tool. I think that's an important part of that instruction role for librarians as well. Is, is this teaching role, I wonder, and I'm looking at, at you, Dr. Schnelling, because uh, you're in, engaged in, the, in this great transition in Germany. Is this teaching role changing in your library? among your staff? Are you doing things differently than you were five years ago? Um, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, digitization has uh, taken uh, every part of the library, of the librarian's work, and it would be quite a surprise if nothing had changed um, within our working conditions. Um, so everything, I think, is different from the time when I was um, a library apprentice. I started my work in 1980, and uh, I was still used to card catalogs, to microfiche. Microfiche were considered a great progress at that time. Uh, 
nothing remained from these historical conditions, and I think everything has changed within our library. Is, is, I'm wondering if anyone out there would like to talk about instruction and, and pedagogy in um, the world of the digital, um, I'm not phrasing this very clearly, but I think you probably, you know, in, um, in, our, in our new hybrid digital environments and how that's changing how you, or if it is, work with students and faculty and each other and the amount of training that goes on internally. Yeah. I, I, thank you. I actually had another question, but I think it relates to your new question, so I hope I can connect them. Um, I beg to disagree with the idea that if you use digital tools, they don't change you. Like, I know we've been saying print is still important, and print is a technology also. It's very different to store information in a manuscript than to store it in a book and to refer to the page. That was a technology, that was different, that changed the way we thought about stuff. And the reason I cherish my education in Germany so much, going back to your question of how do we teach, is that they didn't only teach us how to drag and drop stuff, but they, they really encourage us to think uh, in a very German way, I think, that it's an engineering mind, how things are, are built. They, they were forcing us to think about technology not like a black box, but to really understand what does it mean to shape humanity's information, information which is liquid, into binary, binary systems. And that, that changes everything. Doing models with computers changes everything. And I think it's something we really have to ask ourselves and, uh, and play with it. Like the BNF is, I think, are, they're doing things that I, I think they couldn't have done without technology. Uh, I don't know. And it's been done differently. It's a, it's a provocation, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Any, any tool we use is going to change how we think. Um, what I meant was it doesn't change my basic approach as an historian, but it does give me uh, resources that it, I wouldn't normally have as an historian. And this is one of the things that we really need to make our students understand, that we need to make the people coming to our libraries understand is there are doors that can open up that change um, the, the quality of information, the kinds of information, the integrity of the information, they can start asking questions about whether it's really uh, correct and reliable. We know actually that a lot of the things that we have in print um, aren't necessarily 100% true. Uh, I, I, I won't go into that lecture, but it's, it's you know, people in the 19th century sometimes um, that we, we revere as important historians uh, actually uh, have, we have evidence today they simply made some things up. And we have that in part because we have much better access to sources through some of these digital tools. So in that sense, it really does change us. I guess I just wanted to um, add to what you were saying about how the tools change us and how, um, but I mean, just, it's still, like you said, you're, um, you're a historian, a scholar, and it, it all comes back to the research question. What do you want to do? What do you want to find out? And the tools take you to another, another interpretation that you couldn't have done with a traditional mode of scholarship. So it, it is, it's a tool to take you to another way of understanding or analyzing something. So I think with pedagogy, when, when I work with my faculty, it's a question, that's the first question, what do you want to do? And I don't always know how to do every single thing in Omeka or Scalar or whatever. And, and I was actually um, taught 
some things by Harriet Green, that digital humanities librarian, a few months ago. And it was more just that framework of thinking. If I know basically what a tool can do, I can work around and think about with the faculty member and talk them through what they, how, what kind of tool would be appropriate. And we might make a lot of mistakes together, but it's, it's research. A, a good Hegelian dialectic. We have an idea, we have new tools to think differently about it and we come up with something better. That's a little bit simplification, but there really is an interaction. Doesn't make us less of the discipline we were, but it's something new that's coming out. I agree. I keep talking, I'm sorry. This is the danger of being a professor. I'll bring it back into the, the library world, though. The, the tools that we've built, um, and this was part of the earlier discussion, I think, the tools that we've built often become outmoded and obsolete, and that we hold on to them. So I was, I was pleased to hear Robert's presentation about Sophie and, and constant growth and adaptation of that as you go. I, I, I know of many projects that have stagnated um, and, and disappeared because uh, the faculty is retiring or, or something to that effect, and they, they try to hand the hard drive to the library, and the library just can't do anything with it, um, ourselves included. Um, but a lot of times that the, the the data goes out with the tool, uh, and I think that adapting those approaches, um, as as many institutions are, we're talking about here, I think is important. Is separating the data from the tools, and and that's that's a pretty key component, I think, of anything we need to build moving forward. I am really thankful that so many of the people who are here today are the people who are working directly with the faculty on the tools and on the, on the collection building. Um, and, um, you know, and that we do have people from um, more than just um, the U.S. in our group today. And so, um, I guess, since I think we probably have wine outside, I would like to thank you all very, very much for coming and participating and um, thank our sponsors, thank the poster presenters, thank especially the, the planning team that um, you know, just did an amazing job and um, thank our guest speakers. Um, thank you everybody. <laughs>